Hey, Bian, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? Good. Good to see you again, Matt. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm trying to remember when it was. Um, I think probably <laughs> we've. I think we've spoken. We might have even done two podcasts. I know we first spoke definitely in the midst of lockdown. I think you were in India at the time. Yep. Um, yep. Today you're in California, right? Yes. Yep. Cool. Well, look, we. I'm going to let you. I mean, let me do a very very brief uh, intro, you know, award-winning thought leader, futurist, educationalist, TEDx speaker, and of course, a champion of startups in the sustainability space, which we're going to talk about. Um, but that is just a snippet. Maybe you can give a little bit of background on yourself, uh, the Hungry Lab and, and everything you're doing before we get into some of the questions. Sure. Thanks so much for the kind introduction, Matt. Um, so uh, I have a finance background and also a, a background in uh, international development. And uh, I put all of that together to form the Hungry Lab. And it was really about how do we uh, really help empower the next generation of innovators, startup founders, and social entrepreneurs at the intersection of applying um, exponential technology to sustainability, as well as to uh, create thought leaders and to develop not just the products and the startups themselves, but also the environments and the ecosystems that enable, um, you know, future generations of organizations and, and social on enterprises to, to flourish. And really taking all of that, and we're really focusing on building regenerative uh, futures, not just focusing on building resilient startups and resilient founders, but regenerative. And there's a, there's a big distinction there. Uh, and so that's what we've been really working on, especially, um, uh, you know, during COVID that really accelerated uh, the need for us to, to focus on this area. Cool. Just to, for our audience, can you define that, that regenerative in terms of, of startups, what that means in terms of, of a startup? Right. So if you think about the traditional definition, definition first of what resiliency is, it really is, you know, if, if, if you keep getting punched, how many times can you get back up? Right. Yep. But especially during COVID, and we were working on this question long before COVID of finding out a way to help more startups survive past the early dangerous stages. Right. Yeah. And for out why so many fail. And the biggest issue is um, not just uh, creating a successful product, but creating long term ecosystems for systemic change. When we want to talk about, you know, not just selling a product, but actually creating impact, solving for global challenges, especially, you know, UN Sustainable Development Goals, a lot of these key issues related to climate, related to sustainability, um, key planetary challenges, you need to change systems. So it requires a new mindset and new paradigm shift in how we build up organizations. And it needs to be we need to create win-win-win ecosystems. And that's where um, regeneration comes into play. Not just how many times uh, can we, uh, you know, get back up after we get knocked down, because that, that implies accepting the current status quo. And yep. the same mindset that has gotten us into trouble in the status quo cannot be the same mindset that gets us out of it, right? So regeneration means um, taking all of these concepts, applying regenerative ecological principles and building up the better futures, building back a better system, reimagining, reshaping a better system and not accepting the status quo. So new ways of doing things, new business models, new ways to thrive, um, going from competition to collaboration, ecosystems to ecosystems yep. and all um, what's entailed there. Cool. Look, I, I know um, you were doing this long before um, lockdown before COVID and I, I almost hate bringing up COVID and lockdown, but, but I think, um, cause we don't talk about it anymore. It's kind of a distant memory, but you and I yeah. kind of met during that you're in India at the time from, from memory. Um, you were doing all this before. Did, I mean, what has been, was from your point of view and the work you do, was there additional impact because of lockdown? Did it change things or for you? Was it just, Hey, it's kind of business as normal. This is just another kind of, you know, um, block in the path that we got to get over. Like, like, did that kind of change how you were doing things, how you're working with startups or, or, or not? Yeah. Um, yes and no. So for us internally, we were virtual from day one. We were doing uh, remote incubation around the world since we started in 2016, launched in 2017. But I think for the rest of the world, what we were getting in from in terms of inbound demand and inbound requests was a, a greater hunger uh, and sense of urgency to learn more 
about how we can uh, create better systems change, about partnerships for systems change. And um, people were asking more of the right questions and heading more in the right direction. Yeah. And so that was very encouraging. And actually our research arm really grew during COVID uh, because there was a greater demand uh, for insights related to this area. Cool. Um, I want to talk about startups specifically in the the, the sustainability, environmental um, space. I know you've had some some exposure. I think when we last had a quick conversation, maybe six months ago, uh, you were doing research work in, in this area. Um, yeah, what what are you seeing? General question, but you know, how, how much how much are you seeing in terms of this kind of plethora of different startups in terms of environment and any particular area? Obviously, carbon removal is is a big area right now. But yeah, talk to us about what you're seeing and, and let's dive into some specifics around that. Sure, uh, we're seeing um, a lot of. Uh, improvement and a lot of uh, awareness around this area. Uh, specifically, I what is very encouraging uh, for me to see, um, and especially with the various programs that I'm working with, innovation funds around the world, is more attention to the unsexier, um, less attention drawing um, uh, components of environmental startups, climate yep. change startups, climate tech, for example, natural uh, waste management, right? Yep. And, and, and those types of things, especially in um, Southeast Asia, where that is such a huge issue, plastics, right, pollution, waste management, uh, na natural uh, uh, resource management, a lot of these things are coming to the forefront, which is very, very encouraging because they still are very underrepresented and it's important that they get the attention, get more and more of the attention. Another thing we're seeing is more talk about how actually the conversation around cryptocurrency see Bitcoin and all of that from being an environmental damager to actually being able to help uh, in terms of, you know, um, and so that has been another shift in the conversation. We're also seeing um, some unfortunate backtracking, like with the UK government's recent announcement, how they're going to have to move their goalpost related to net zero yeah. and other types of, you know, various different things around the world and more extreme natural disaster events uh, happening. Um, that has uh, obviously, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's severe concern, but also it has spurred a lot more innovation in this area. And we're seeing more startups go into natural disaster management. I actually was a keynote speaker in uh, Singapore's national um, disaster. It was a global national disaster conference conference um, last year in November. Uh, and it was it was great to see uh, the number of innovations, not just on actual react reactive, like recovery types of technologies, but also on prevention, uh, which is in very encouraging. Uh, and so we're starting to see um, it sort of balance out in terms of reaction to prevention, but there's still a lot more to do. In, in also, I think starting with the us there has been a politicization of esg yep. and, yeah 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 and for sure i've seen this <laughs> yeah especially in the us right and yeah. that, that i think that I've, we've seen that trickle to certain pockets around the world uh in varying degrees um and and so what we're looking at right now is moving beyond esg right because yeah. just before when people are talking about csr and then to esg there's still a lot of greenwashing that goes on yeah Unfortunately, and that's what, you know, the naysayers politicize, right? They find a couple bad apples or a couple of unsuccessful case studies and they, they extrapolate that to demean the whole, the whole thing. I think people do still mean well, but what we're missing is that systems change and there needs to be better um, collaboration and discourse and more effective discourse on, on effective collaboration and partnerships. There's a lot of cynicism around public-private partnerships based on what um, you know occurred before, but there is renewed interest in redefining that. And I think this the the urgency here with all of these uh, hazard, hazard hazardous events, climate extreme events that are happening around the world, it, it's forcing us to to re relook at this issue. Um, and so we're going we're seeing um, new models in terms of uh, partnerships. Um, new types of um, ecosystems being built uh, and actually more government interest in co-building uh, startups together. Um, one of the startups that we're um, incubating is a solar tech startup in uh, India. 
and they have received a lot of significant uh, interest from the local, the both local as well regional and national governments, due to aligned uh, policy frameworks to spur investment um, in clean energy and, and solar tech being one of the beneficiaries of that. Yep. Um there's a bunch of things I want to unpack in there, but actually just you prompted one question at the end there. In terms of you're obviously working in, in a lot of different geographies. Um, I know you spend a bit of time in India. I mean, I'm assuming the the difference in terms of the appetite for investment, the types of investment, the 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 um, you know, the public versus private money. I mean, is it just completely different in the US versus India or, or is it it's similar? I mean, for you, I imagine trying to get your head around that is with all the different markets you work in, there's some challenges in understanding those different funding mechanisms and, and the motivations. Yes, uh, the similarities, the, I mean, there are similarities and there are differences. The similarities are that um, the government is investing a significant amount uh, in climate tech. Um, yeah. and, um, and, and especially in India where the infrastructure movement as a whole is yeah. growing. It, 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 it's, it's grown so much uh, and they're really investing in uh, really investing in this. Um, we've seen also uh, the the hunger uh, being a bit different uh, mm. in terms of the innovation ecosystems yep. um, and also the needs being more localized um, where you there there's greater gaps in, in certain areas, um, especially in emerging markets in lower to middle income countries where you still have the rural and the urban disparity. We have it in the US, uh, but in a lot of the um, LMIC markets um, that uh, we engage in, there's an, the the difference between the, um, you know, the, not just the digital divide, but also the access to resources and the burden being put uh, on those who suffer the most from climate um hazards or cl climate events um th th that difference is is much more apparent uh in such markets like india sure. and so um what we focus on there uh like we have a partnership with a prestigious scientific research foundation focused on agriculture research in southern india there it really is to focus on the smallholder farmers getting them access to market focusing on women uh tribal areas youth and more of the disenfranchised markets uh, because there the the gap is much bigger. Cool. Now you've definitely perked my interest. Obviously, now kind of six months into working with smallholder farmers and surrounded <laughs> by them, um, yeah, mostly for for myself in in Southeast Asia and also East Africa. So not so much in India. But um, can you talk to me about if you have examples? Can you talk to me about some of the innovations, some of the startups that are emerging in that? space and what they're doing, how they're bridging that gap between those um, communities, those economies, and, and yeah, love to kind of unpack some of that stuff. Yeah, so I'm um, going back to the solar tech startup because they're, they're a great example of going from a product to a platform to a whole ecosystem um, and, and having so many different SDG impacts. So Power Mitra uh, is um, our, our startup and they are uh, India's uh, largest um, solar aggregator. Yep. So they are basically like the Amazon for solar installers and they vet uh, and they provide vocational training for disenfranchised youth to get jobs and become solar entrepreneurs themselves. So they provide the training. So you have um, an impact there with rural youth uh, who would be otherwise unemployed, especially uh, young women. They focus on providing employment for young women. And they're also solving a key issue for uh, the middle market consumer, which is how do I have access to affordable solar? Yep. Um, in the past, you just had huge infrastructure pro pro uh, projects that were out of reach for your average, uh, you know, middle class uh, resident um, and or, you know, small business. And so they've really covered this gap. And so they're um, al allowing small business um um, you know, small business industry, SMEs, as well as middle market, um, you know, middle class residents uh, and consumers really be able to access this. So making an impact on the environmental side, uh, 
uh, and providing other opportunities for financers um, to finance these projects. And so it's a win-win-win ecosystem for all the stakeholders. Uh, and so this has actually perked the interest of not just the on the climate side, but also on the unemployment side and the and the and the youth side in terms of government interest um, and other types of, of of interest in the startup. And so that's something we've seen. Um, uh, very uh, increasingly uh, common is to build these types of ecosystems. Yep. We held a Startups uh, for Sustainability event um, with our partner um, in Bangalore, as well as Monash University, their uh, Australian university, but we were working with their Kuala Lumpur Malaysia office. The three, uh, um, us, the Ind Indian Institute of Science, who was the host of this um, program, as well as Monash University, we held the Startups for Sustainability panel and we invited uh, uh, several of the startups that we were working with, um, as well as within our ecosystem, to come and talk about their experiences. And so we're seeing not just on the climate side, but also on consumer behavior. So there's a great um, company called Loopworm, and they are trying to um, uh, improve carbon footprints of the food industry uh, by um, educating consumers and creating uh, products from insects. Oh, wow, cool. So yeah, that's just another type of innovative thing where it's an entire new category that they're building. They're not yep. just expanding the traditional category like solar or clean energy, which is more developed, but creating a new category and trying to push the envelope more in terms of um, in provoking consumer change and, 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 and mindsets. Um, and, and, and so that is something that's really encouraging uh, and we're seeing more and more interest in, in investment in that area. Cool. Maybe a good segue. I wanted to ask about investment, fundraising. Um, you know, I'm somewhat of an oldie now in terms of <laughs> being in the startup space and having fundraised and still seem to be doing it on and off. Um, you know, what are some of the, I suppose, opportunities and challenges in terms of the environmental startup sector? You know, what is it the same types of uh vcs is it different you know if if i'm a you know a young startup founder and I, i've got some innovative piece of tech be it solar be it whatever be it you know new food systems am i looking at a different pathway to vcs is it different types of vcs um you know how does it differ i suppose from your, your typical kind of tech space fundraising and and uh yeah opportunities and challenges a few things in there i know but yeah, so a great um, uh, a, a publication actually uh, that we just did um, for uh, GSMA, uh, we we um, we created a report um, that was just published last year, um, actually no, this past year, on um, the like profiling the growth journeys of various SDG related startups across um, Southeast Asia and Africa and, and South Asia. And one of the key trends there was that um, a number, a large number of these grew and got initially seeded from grant funders, yep. um, CSMA, um, as well as from competitions like the Mass Innovation Challenge, um, various different prizes, various different, uh, you know, Google, uh, Google Launchpad. So a lot of these incubators and accelerators and, um, and, uh, and various different grant funding and prizes. There's a lot of opportunities in the grant space that I think a lot of impact driven social enterprises and startups can take advantage of that they may not be aware of. They think, oh, we need to go to VC, VC, VC. But you got to really make sure that your audience is also impact focused and the values are aligned. Because we've seen one of the biggest challenges for startups as they get going is um, not having aligned vision with their investors. Yeah, and that, sure. has, that has created a lot of conflict that um, could have been prevented. Um, and we're also seeing that that's also a good way for them to get um, more press uh, by winning these prizes. Uh, and um, and so th and there's so many of these different types of programs and opportunities that these startups can take advantage of. So that was one one key trend. We also looked at um, you know if you look at some of the key unicorns that have come out, uh, and I don't like to use unicorns as a general example because they are in the minority and they may not fit. Just because you're not a unicorn doesn't mean you can't make an impact, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so, but what we did find was that there was a mix of debt financing yep. as well as VC funding. And the initial funders um, that were seed funders ended up investing in future rounds. 
Uh, so that was another trend. Okay. Uh, and and as well as the key unicorns, for example, eFishery, which is um, uh, uh, an aquaculture startup out of um, Indonesia, they became a unicorn, as well as Twiga Foods in Kenya, they also became a unicorn. They, the, the common things were they were all marketplaces and platforms yep. where they connected consumer, they connected um, they not just connected consumer with producer, but they also created customer stickiness and ongoing value. Um, and by, you know, by unlocking value in the, in the supply chain, uh, and providing a lot of other different value added segments. So that is something that, um, we found as, as a key trend is creating marketplace and network effects. Um, and, 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 and so what we're seeing, and so one thing that I'd also like to point out is that the traditional method of looking for VCs, um, may not be a viable option depending on the market you're in. For example, in Indonesia, there's a lot of, um, entrepreneurs that are focused on in the environment just cause it's such a huge issue everywhere. Right. But because really the hub, you, I mean, you have Jakarta right? You either have to be in yep. Jakarta. Bali is growing, but for a lot of the investors, Jakarta is still a hub. But when you're an island country of 17,000 islands, you still have a lot of great entrepreneurs who want to make a difference, but because they're located in, uh, um, you know, less, uh, you know, less accessible islands, uh, under resource islands, they may not have um, the same types of available resources to them to develop their startups. And so, you have to look at partnering potentially with local NGOs or other types of organizations, community organizations and other opportunities uh, be just because the VC, um, you know, the traditional VC um, uh, environment is not accessible to you. Cool. Some really good stuff in there. So if I paraphrase that, I mean, obviously grants is rarely something you're looking at, at as a traditional startup, but certainly if you're in the impact space. So um you know, mixture of grants, government money, um, some other stuff you mentioned. You, it, you were you were quoting a report there. Do you have a? Is there a link to that report I can leave in the in the podcast after? Is it public information? Yeah, or? I can cool. share it. It's it's published um, a report, and we actually have a webinar um, oh, cool. that we did with DMA, um talking about the report and sharing some of the key insights that we we learned from it. Awesome. Well, I'll leave those links in in the podcast notes. Um, you touched on something else. I, I remembered actually now we did a podcast a couple of years ago talking about SDGs and you mentioned SDGs two or three times. I wanted to just just ask a couple of questions around that. I mean, for me, um, the SDGs have been a framework I've used in terms of our reporting. Um, but people have, I think, a mixed opinion on all because there's so many reporting mechanisms. Yeah, just give us um, your, I suppose, your view, your opinion on the SDGs. How are they best used? as you know and as not just a marketing tool although they're quite useful as a marketing tool frankly um and quite a good communicator in terms of what a project is looking at but just give us yeah your kind of i suppose ten thousand foot view on the sdgs where they're useful where they're not necessarily and and how you're seeing them used with startups great so from my experience um the sdgs are a great marketing uh tool and framework to educate people and to succinctly frame all of these challenges that we're dealing with, right? In yep. a easy to remember way uh, that any lay audience can understand, right? So it's a great communication tool. What it does not provide is actually a pathway um, in, in which to do it, as well as, um, the necessary, again, going back to systems, the necessary systemic changes to the status quo that need to be done, right? Mm -hmm. So before you actually actualize and realize the SDG objectives, there are a lot of things that need to take into place. The same types of, again, the mindsets, practices, operating models in which we've traditionally done stuff, even in development, which there is a lot of, um, you know, areas for improvement in this space um, with waste and with missed opportunities and, and, and all of that and inefficiencies. And so I'd like to combine it with a lot of um, other frameworks as well as our own lived experience. And one thing um, that I like to recommend um, is the inner, the IDGs, the inner development yep. goal. 
Uh, and they were actually created because people noticed there was this gap in, okay, we know what the SDGs are, but how do we go about them? Well, we can't achieve them if we don't start with changing people's mindsets yep. to begin with, right? And the IDGs are a good way to start there. And so I always recommend people to, um, to look at it um, as being flexible in terms of their perspective and incorporating a lot of different frameworks as well as lived experience and localizing it and contextualizing it. Because what may work in a first world developmental context here um, may not work um, all around the world. And so it needs to be contextualized, it needs to be culturalized, and it needs to be localized. Cool. Very interesting. I've not heard the uh, that IDG acronym, so interesting one. So. Um, you mentioned crypto blockchain earlier, right at the beginning of the call. Um, I'm actually off to the Stellar conference next week, which will be interesting. They're doing some super interesting stuff in the impact space um, uh, with MoneyGram, with uh, relief work. And yeah, you, you mentioned now there's been this kind of shift. I've been out of the sector a little bit. Obviously, I was kind of co-founder of blockchain business some time ago when we first met. But yeah, what are you seeing in terms of blockchain? Are you? I was interested because you've been in India for me. India, it was kind of pushed away for a while, at least crypto and blockchain. And also this difference between the two, which I know, and I know when I talk like this, I make the assumption that the audience know, but often people really don't. People have heard of cryptocurrency. People may not have heard of blockchain, um, depending on where you come from. But yeah, just talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing. You mentioned you're seeing some exciting stuff in terms of crypto in this space. Uh, and I assume you mean blockchain and crypto, but yeah, I'd love to unpack a little bit of that. Yeah, so um, tokenization of green assets uh, is something okay. that we've been seeing, like a carbon utility token. So uh, the sale of each token goes towards investments in carbon capture and carbon yep. offsetting programs. Uh, so that's um, an example of, of something that we've seen um, and that I think more and more companies are adding to their portfolios. Um, and we're also seeing, you know, with the, you know, going from poop, uh, uh, going from uh, the first generation, right? Uh, crypto and, and blockchain 1.0 to now blockchain you know, 3.0, the environment, environmental impact has become less. Yeah. Um, and also we've also seen other applications in terms of tracking supply chain, right? Um, uh, as well as, um, you know, providing more financing uh, in this area. And I think it's also important um, to look at if, when we went from blockchain 1.0 to blockchain 3.0, um, the world has significantly shifted, right? Yeah. Um, and so when we're looking at how the world has shifted, we've seen a significant um, greater um, awareness in the, the environmental uh, impact, the, the footprint, and the endeavor to improve. So, you know, a lot of forecasting models are actually showing, for example, um, the new and latest Ethereum uh, uh, proof of stake model, right, yep. is 90% more energy efficient uh, than proof of work models, right? Cool. So there's, there's a lot of improvement going on within the space itself, just because it's getting more attention. Um, and so, not just the application, but the the in, uh, the the technology itself. So that's something that is is encouraging. I mean, obviously, there's going to be ongoing debate, right? Uh, but the the improvement ha um, it, it, it cannot um, cannot be debated. Yeah, I think it's it's um, obviously the Ethereum upgrade. Whenever that happened, now it's probably over a year ago, right? But the yeah. problem before then was that the whole rhetoric was around the negative energy impact of blockchain or which was not really a correct statement right it was in certain right. areas so do you are you also seeing because part of the problem i always saw is that it's this kind of whole having to talk about crypto and blockchain versus it just being embedded into a solution and talking about the value proposition of that solution are you seeing more of that happening now where people aren't you know people don't when you're selling a when you're building a tech startup, you don't talk about the layer stacks of the technology. You talk about the value proposition, and that was the problem for me before that everyone was talking blockchain. Are you seeing that kind of transformation a little bit now, where it's just being used rather than talked about in that way? Right. Well, now it's being uh, embedded into the the um, you know the the vernacular of Web three, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so that's a that's a whole thing. Um, but I think. 
you know, it, it's like right now everyone's talking about all this AI stuff. You know, mm -hmm. we've, been, we've been using AI, you know, for years, even before this chat GPT came along, right? Before chat GPT, there was Jarvis. Uh, before that, it was called Jeeves, actually. And, and so many different other ones that were around for years. And I, was, I had an AI assistant uh, since 2016. Right. Um, and, and so, but, but the fact that it wasn't romanticized or it yeah. wasn't, customized, it wasn't some, you know, uh, it wasn't blown up in the media. It was just something that people used. It was a tool, right? Obviously chat GPT raised the stakes just given its, its functionality, but it, um, you know, and, and the media likes to sensationalize a lot of stuff and it, you know, people just don't ask people get a sense of fear out of a lot of things when you just talk about the technology yourself, because your average mm. person off the street is not going to know how even what a blockchain is or what a Bitcoin is, yeah. right? Or even know how to even explain it um, or what actually AI is. Uh, and and so um, there there's a fear of the unknown. And like, to your point, um, it is embedded in, it's it's part of the stack, yep. right? You don't advertise it, but it's it's part of the stack. And you're you're like I always tell our startups, you know, your consumer is not going to care at all what your back end is. They want your product to work. They want to be it to be affordable. They want it to be seamless. They want it to be easy, right? Um, and and so and they want to see results. That's it. No one cares what you build it on. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. And to your point about AI, it's a really good point. I think, look, I mean, the AI conversation had been going on for years, really, and, yeah. and it had been being used. The difference is, for me, the good test is I go to my local bar and have a drink and people are talking about chat GPT, then you know something's right. changed, right? And with blockchain, it was also someone just bought a round of drinks because Bitcoin went through the roof. And that was kind of like... That was, you know, no one really understood. You mentioned blockchain and like, what's that got to do with it? So, yeah, it's right. good to see these things start to be embedded, I, I think, more than just kind of buzz it, buzzwords around cafes and, and bars and stuff. Right. And then unfortunately, a lot of times with, you know, anytime there's a new category of technology that where regulation has not cut up, there's always, you know, scammers, right? Mm. With the NFTs, there's always. Stuff. So the, a lot of times that conversation has been hijacked from the in, intrinsic benefits of the technology to, oh my God, scammers. Oh my God, criminals. Oh my God, all the bad stuff, right? Uh, because that's what gets ratings. That's what gets in the news. Yeah. Um, and, and so then it strikes even more fear into the uninformed uh, average consumer. Right. And, and, and so it's, it's, it's a vicious cycle and with human nature, we tend to, act, we tend to feel threatened with the unknown. So we ask these questions like, oh my God, AI is, is it going to take over my job? Hmm. Is my, my industry in threat is, you know, all of these types of very scarcity mindset types of questions when really that those are the wrong questions. You know, the, the question, it was the same questions when we have, oh my God, are cars going to take over take over the horse industry the course and carriage industry <laughs> yeah, right? exactly what happens to those jobs right society evolves and so the question is is it is it it shouldn't be is it going to take my job it should be it's going to be inevitable how can i be a part of the conversation not a victim right how can i use it uh and learn about it and empower myself and my organization to to transmute it right to something that is good for me, good for the organization, or how can I help it amplify the work we're doing, right? I and, couldn't agree and more, yeah. For years and years, AI is gonna help make us more human if we leverage it correctly. Because human beings are not meant to be sitting in a windowless cubicle uh, under fluorescent lighting for 10 hours a day, putting data into Excel. No, humans are not, I, no one says that's my life dream, right? <laughs> yeah. Indeed. when you're a kid, you know, it, 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 and, and, and so that to me, when we get the rote tedious stuff, when we allow, um, AI to do that for us, we are able to get, leave more mind share, uh, and mind space and heart space for being creative, being fully human. And, and so there, the, the, what's ironic is what we're seeing is people are still doing the road stuff. And now we're letting things like mid journey and all of these things create beautiful artwork for us and be, be the, uh, let AI do the creative stuff for us. So I think 
there is a huge opportunity for us to really sit back for our, you know, and, and go deep within ourselves and say, how can I use this to my advantage? How can I leverage stuff? And we're seeing a huge crop of create next gen creators coming up with amazing things, right? Leveraging AI, monetizing AI that they couldn't before. So it's really, you know, like, you know, glass half full or half empty, right? Um, it's about the perspective, but, um, and I, I think this is a great opportunity for us to have this wider conversation because the same conversations that and questions we are asked, we need to be asking for ourselves and our organizations are the same questions on a greater magnitude that we ought to be asking about society itself. What kind of society do we want to show up? What kind of system do we want to build or, or rebuild? Um, and, and what kind of future do we actually want to create? Is it going to be a Skynet type Terminator future? Right? Or is it going to be something much more um, har uh, harmonious? Right? And we're at this critical um, in inflection point where we have this opportunity to, to choose our paths. Awesome. I couldn't agree with you more. I think we need way more positive attitude around, yeah, these new technologies, AI. I think it's exciting. I think it's how you embrace it, not how you push it away. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Look, I didn't have any more questions, but maybe a good one to end on is just uh, if there ha isn't anything I asked, please let me know that you'd like to to answer. But also, you know, just your your kind of vision, I think, which you shared a little bit then anyway. But, you know, for the next kind of 10 years, the, ne the next millennia and beyond some of the stuff you're, you're seeing excited about. Um, be great to hear hear that kind of vision. And and um, yeah. Yeah, what, what what I'm excited about is. If again, a big if. So, uh, if we if we um, allow ourselves, um, you know, to work harmoniously with AI and let it help make us more human um, and become more human, we're going to see, you know, a, an evolution from you know the, the industrial revolution, right? Yep. For you know, for the future of work, to a shift in cognition really because of the impact of what everything is doing to our minds how it needs we need to change how we learn right the schooling system everything mm. and with that is going to be the future of a learning which requires a shift in how we want to show up as humans right the shift in the human condition and so talk i talk a lot about the future of being and what does yeah. that look like right so there is going to be an existential shift um that requires everyone's participation and so that's exciting it's also petrifying at the same time <laughs> right because um who is going to be involved in these conversations right and and so that's some, a lot of the stuff that we're doing with the hungry lab reschool is uh inspiring learning unlearning um and unschooling a lot of these you know mindsets of of the past what no longer serves us and and getting rid of that and and really help inspiring uh and and, and reshaping and reimagining the future um and and taking uh, the future generation of change makers with us on this journey uh in terms of reimagining the new system and so that's something that's very exciting and it's also um something that we can't do alone and so it does require a global village and so um that's what we've been working on cool um you know what, as you're talking there, I think we could probably do another podcast. It would be off topic for carbon conversations, but just around the whole kind of inner journey for outer impact kind of thing, because I can see just the way you passionately share the work you're doing. A lot of it is about that inner journey, right, in terms of, you know, how important that is to to achieving a lot of these outer goals. So maybe there's another format we can do a, a conversation around that. Yeah. But um, All right. That's the, that's the first thing. Sorry. Say again, yeah. I, you cut out then. Sorry change you to change the world. And unfortunately, everyone wants to change the world, but very few want to change themselves. And it, it, it goes hand in hand. Cool. So. Well, what a great statement to end on. Before we close off, can you just share uh, your details where people can learn more about yourself, The Hungry Lab, maybe get in touch. Um, and I'll also share these in the, in the speaker notes. Great. Yeah. So you can um, uh, email us at hello at thehungrylab.com. Um, visit us on our website, thehungrylab.com. We're in the process of updating our website. Um, you can contact me on LinkedIn, um, just my name, Bien Lee, uh, and uh, you should be able to find me. Uh, and um, yeah, I look forward to hearing from you and connecting. Awesome, Bien. It's been a pleasure as always. Hopefully we'll eventually meet face-to-face -face one of these days. I think it's been three yeah. or four years of online calls, but um 
yeah, enjoy your evening. Thanks for taking the time to join the podcast. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, Matt.